asking. The name she had for me was Ugly Fang, like T-H-A-N-G. And I wrote this in my book, the way she would say Ugly Fang and the way she would hold the fang and the vibrato that would come off of her voice would be just so gut-wrenching. Like I could, you know, it puts me back. If I really allow myself to go there, you can feel the chills just come over me even as a little yeah. kid hearing that. It was Ugly Fang and it was also E. For me, when I started working with him, First of all, you're excited you booked a regular role. You're a series regular on a <laughs> national television show for BT or a Tyler Perry show, all these things. So my mama was like, girl, you made it. I knew. I was saying, I knew. <laughs> Tyler Perry saw you, right? <laughs> True story. I swear to you. Said my baby made it. <laughs> my baby, my made, baby it. made it. I made it, okay? No, I think once okay. everyone saw it, it was like, oh, it's about it's the White House drama. And I'm like, yes, however, it 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 relies on the stories of the people who work there and like you said we're following them home to see what happens and what it ensues all while trying to run yeah. the white house when i tell myself when i'm dreaming about something i tell myself like you got to dream bigger sometimes you're feeling like you're at the peak of the bigness of that dream but you're not, mm -hmm. not, not even <laughs> like, close i'm not even close right so then i not have to close. stretch my mind <laughs> Grew up in Louisiana. Um, what was what was your childhood like? Great question. <laughs> My <laughs> childhood was let's see, a lot of ups and downs. I guess you would say. I grew up in a time where what was really prevalent was the brown paper bag, and there's a thing called the brown paper bag test. And what that means is, for anyone who doesn't know, if you're darker than a brown paper bag then you're treated completely different. You're not afforded diff you know, different social norms. So you can't get into certain clubs. People treat you like you're completely less than because of the darkness and the melanin that you have in your skin. And so I grew up with that a lot. Just growing up in my childhood, there were kids I couldn't play with down the street just because I was too dark. And there was one kid in particular, his mom would, if I was outside, she'd be like, oh, you can't go out there because Taj is there. Are there, and then after years of living down the street from them, she sometimes would be like, well, I'll let you go, but you definitely got to come in before your dad gets home. So she would literally call him in before his dad would get home. So his dad would see him playing with, with me because I was too dark. Um, and you have to also understand, I grew up in a time in Louisiana where this was it's almost like watching a movie. It's the best way I can describe it, being in a period piece. If it puts you there, this was like ingrained in the fabric of the culture, of the mindset of the people of the time, right? This is exactly what it was. So much so, I had a family member that was of that same mindset, but to like the umpteenth power, if you will. Oh. <laughs> you know, she would, um, <clears throat> myself and other cousins who were darker skinned, she would call us out different names. Now, growing up in the South, we all had different nicknames, right? From the South, everybody had a little funny nickname, but mine was so demeaning. The name she had for me was Ugly Fang, like T-H-A-N-G. And I wrote this in my book, the way she would say ugly fang and the way she would hold the fang and the vibrato that would come off of her voice would be just so gut-wrenching. Like I could, you know, it puts me back. If I really allow myself to go there, you can feel the chills just come over me even as a little yeah. kid hearing that. It was ugly fang and it was also E. E is not necessarily what I put in my book just because I didn't really know how to put it in letters to create and craft a word that everyone can read and fully understand but the way she would say it is eh she black get off me eh 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 come here like eh my name was ugly thing or eh so growing up i had to deal with a lot of colorism as well as racism um no matter where i went the school was bullied because of it you know just again it was everywhere so the only place that i felt really safe as a kid was in my tub Wow. And in my tub, I would sit in the water and I would just pray to God and ask him if he could just make me, like that was my solution. I felt like, okay, God, if you can just make me lighter, like 
then my aunt would like me, then people would like me better, and this would be better. And then I was so specific, like it's just so crazy even when I think about it as a young five, six year old, you know. I would sit there and I'd be like, but if you can make me the color in between my knuckles, because the color in between my knuckles were a little bit lighter, so it's not like I'm asking for, you know, anything major, like just a little bit. I don't want you to make it too drastic, God, because if you do, people may notice and then I'll make it tease. So just make it a little bit, like these, this is the earnest prayers of a child, you know. Right. Um, so I went through that less and less as I got older. My mother had to, and my father had to teach me, you know, how to love myself and I had to learn how to develop, you know, self-love and build up my confidence because I had none. So because of that upbringing, because I was so close to me, you know, I got it in high school, got it in college, I got it just living in the South. It wasn't until I got out of, I should say Louisiana, it wasn't until I got out of Louisiana that I was able to get to a space where that wasn't the norm, that wasn't expected. Like I'm in college literally dating a guy and he's like, and I'm like, oh, can I come in? He's like, oh yeah, my people are like that, you good. If it was my grandmother, you couldn't come in, but my, we good, we good. This whole family was light skin. Like it's just, you know, crazy, you know, but this is like, I'm in college, like what? Okay. Right. <laughs> but that, that's how I grew up, like that's what I knew. So when I moved to California, it was like, oh wow, this is like a melting pot of all kind of different, you know, nationalities and races and religions and all these different things. And people were more so just people. It wasn't just singling out being dark skin or darker than a brown paper bag. It was just, it was a much grander scale. So then it took me years to be able to overcome all of the trauma I'd been through <laughs> growing up there yeah. to get yeah. to the place where I am now. Well, that was a long-winded answer, but you asked me. <laughs> no, that's that's a good answer. Like, I, <laughs> it opens up a floodgate of yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so when you, when you're when you're dealing with that, like how I, I had like a colorism issue. Like I wanted to be lighter, but it took a very long time for me to realize that it was actually an issue. Um, at at what point did you become comfortable with your skin? Mm, great question. So. When I was 25 was the first time I looked in the mirror and I knew exactly where I was. I can just put myself in this place. I looked in the mirror at 25 and I accepted the skin that I'm in. Mm -hmm. It took me five more years. It wasn't until I turned 30 that I began to start the journey of loving the skin I'm in. So it took about five years from the acceptance to the start of the beginning of the love because the acceptance was like, okay, after 25 years of dealing with this, okay, this is what you look like. All right, so this is it. This is this is the color of my skin. Okay, it was like the acceptance of it. Like, okay, it's yeah. like if you're in, you know, if you're going through something and you're like, I accept, I have this problem, <laughs> right? Okay, mm -hmm. and then now you have to start putting on in the work. And then by the time I turned 30, um, I still was de dealing with a lot of different things, but that's when I slowly, I mean, like it was a slow and steady race. Like, you know, the tortoise and the hare, you know? <laughs> Like, yeah. It yeah. was um, it was a slow process of like I'm giving, saying affirmations to myself, um, you know, looking in the mirror and dare I say liking what I'm looking back, you know, the process of looking in the mirror and and speaking into me versus down on me because oftentimes we're our hardest critics. Oh, I don't like this, mm -hmm. especially sometimes as women, you know, we can definitely critique ourselves a lot. I was, used to be one of those for sure. And now, well, and then I should say at 30 or in that 30, 33, those three years when I first started, it was the first time I looked at myself and I was like, man, I'm worthy. Yeah. I am enough. I am beautiful. I am whatever these affirmations were that were showing up for me at that time that I needed to hear. But I had never said that to myself ever. And I just bust out crying. And that was wow. like the first breakthrough, if you will, of like, okay, you're going to be all yeah. right. We're going to get through this. You're, you're enough. Yeah. Cause it's 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 a hard it's a hard <laughs> journey, and mm -hmm. regardless of how many compliments you get, you don't see it. Right. And it's like everyone can say, "Oh, you're so attractive. You're so this. You're so that." And you're like, eh, but if I were just a <laughs> little bit, like it's you you give yourself yeah, that yeah. that alternative, like give me like a little bit less sunlight. Maybe I shouldn't go outside in the summertime before three o'clock. Like it's just you don't. <laughs> You do That's everything it. to try not to get darker. 
and yeah. no one really understands like what that does to you like growing up it's it's mm-hmm. crazy yeah uh. i and listen i mean every example you're giving is my life <laughs> i used to say to my mom you know oh you have to say i'm beautiful or you're pretty because i'm your daughter you gotta say that but i didn't fully <laughs> believe it you know she's like no you are right. and i'm like no you have to say that you know <laughs> um my mom She's always, my mom and my dad have always been my biggest cheerleaders, the biggest people in my life who were the only two people in my life at the time growing up that were giving me the positive, you know, the positivity, the pouring into me, the building me back up. And then I'd go out into the world and not come back bruised again, you know, yeah. um, kind of thing. And then definitely the sun. You know, interesting enough, this is so funny how the dichotomy of your brain works because there was a there was a vast majority of me that was like very aware of my darkness because the world around me let me know daily but then there was this other mm-hmm. part of me because my parents are pouring into me that are just like yeah but i can still do this and i can do this and i can do that right like i still believe somehow not as much but it was like still 30 percent of me like believing in these other things that maybe i'd want to accomplish and do in life it was like the yeah. people versus my parents the constant like battle of you know going up and down up and down or like a seesaw effect, if you will. One day they're winning, one day the people won. The people won today, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but the sun, the sun was always like really big for me. And it wasn't until I was, I wanna say in junior, either junior high or high school, one of my friends who lived down the street from me, everyone thought we were were twins and sisters and we looked very similar growing up. And we were somewhere and this lady was like, oh my God, y'all look so much alike. And she said, yeah, but she's much darker than me. Yeah, but she, yeah, but she darker, she way darker than me. And I just became so aware that even the person that I call my best friend, my sister at the time, right? Friend sister, not blood sister, you know what I mean? At the time Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, she's really aware of this too. I didn't know. Right. And that was the turning point that I began to be acutely aware of the sun, of yeah. the sun to where I would put on sunscreen. The first time I got I got sunburned, I was like, oh, wow, the sun really don't discriminate. I, this, this hurts. <laughs> People go through this every year on purpose. My skin hurt. You know? <laughs> Ow. <laughs> like, <"Yes>, <laughs> I was like, we're not doing that no more. Now I'm like, is there SPF 100? Does it work? Does it block 100%? Now right. I'm like, you know. <laughs> so it's but crazy I became, because... It's aware, yeah. yeah, now it's like I I love being in the sun. Like, I'm like, yeah. let's even this, let's even all this brownness out. Right. Let's, let's get it together. Let's <laughs> tan me, Lord. Like, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's different. Like, I, I love it now. And it again, I was an adult. Before I got to a point where I was like, no, this is actually dope. I like this. But I was mm-hmm. I was an adult. It took it took a very long time. And it was it was a it was a hindrance to a lot. Um, mm-hmm. which brings me to the question. You were you've been acting for a while. Even though a lot of us are just seeing you, you had you didn't just start acting. So yeah. were you acting with the same mindset of not being comfortable with yourself and then still like auditioning and still like getting in front of cameras? Absolutely, yes. Which is so interesting. First, let me say this. You're right. It's I had to become an adult before I could love the sun. Now I love the sun as well. I want to make sure I say that on the record. I love the sun. I love being in the skin I'm in. I love being chocolate, black, dark skin, melanated. Insert word here. Whatever, right? (laughs) Now I live near the beach on purpose. The beach is my happy place. I used to be like, so there's no shade here? Oh my God. You know, run from it. But now I'm like, yes. (laughs) <laughs> Take me. <laughs> Thank you. You know, now I'm like, oh, I'm chocolate, chocolate, you know. But okay, I digress. <laughs> to, to answer your question, yes, I was absolutely going through this, <laughs> this into this entertainment industry with that same mindset, which is so interesting. How I even chose it because I used to model, and then we know there's a lot of rejection in modeling and mm-hmm. a lot of self deprecation that happens along with that too, as well as acting. You know. Um, but I think this was this has been my discovery 
this is maybe like within the past two or three years of my discovery and and pouring myself out into my book, Women Who Shine, and having to go back there to really unpack it because I thought I had done the work enough or just done all the work and I hadn't. Because when things show mm -hmm. up and if it still bothers me, then I'm like, oh, you got to dig deeper into that. Yeah. And the discovery was, ever since I was a kid, I used to love to play pretend. That's what acting was for me, right? My cousins and I, we would watch TV, watch movies, we would act it out and all these different things. But something about playing pretend for me was great because I could pretend to be this other person. I could pretend to be living in this other world. Like my imagination even now as an actor is, is amazing, I say, because I can really put myself in these imaginary circumstances and live truthfully in this, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and I, and if I sit back now and I realize I'm like, wow, the facade, I lived in this facade of I'm okay, but I believed it. I believed I was okay. I believed I was doing good. I believed I was great and wonderful, but I wasn't because I kept going in and out of characters that allowed me to leave my life behind and get into this character and live in this imaginary world and all was great here. And then get out of it. Now I got to deal with my own stuff. Well, okay, I'll be fine. I got to book something else. I got to go over here. So yes, yeah. I was dealing. I was coping. I think is the better, the best word for what I was going through. Not really realizing at the time that I had to work on me. I had to work on. I can no longer allow all those people's opinions and judgments to be my truth. But I, I, had, I had believed it because that's all I knew. That's all I yeah. knew. And that's why knowledge is so much power. That's why representation matters so much. Like even when I do, like if I do an independent project and, and it's, a, I remember I did a lead role for this movie called um, My Online Valentine. And on set, I shot it in Chicago with director, director Christopher Nolan. And on that set, every day when we had background performers there, women were coming up to me and some men, I dare I say, now I think about it. And they were like, it's so great to see you in a lead role as a dark skinned woman. Like, Wow, I've never seen that before. Like, congratulations, sister. Like, oh my God. And I and I was like, Amen. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wow, thank you. Yeah. Because I know the fight. I know the struggle. I know I don't see myself in these roles in these type of movies as the lead. Now I'll be the friend. They are they'll cast mm -hmm. you as a friend, but you may not readily see me as the lead. Or when I say me, someone that looks like me, right? right. Until Issa Ray came out with the photograph. And yeah. I don't know if you remember that time, but Black Twitter was going yeah. crazy because it was like, yes, finally a Black lead. Then she's dark skin and she's dark skin. You know, it was a whole thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it took, it took, it took a lot of discovery and it took a lot of hindsight now for me to look back and be like, ah, that's what was happening. But at the time when you're in your 20s, man, you're trying to understand life. Yeah. <laughs> All the while yeah. growing and becoming who you are. You know, I saw this meme the other day. It was like, oh, if I'm still trying to figure out my life when I get, when I get 30, Somebody, somebody help me. And, and, and someone commented, it was like, somebody tell her. Can somebody tell her? Somebody, <laughs> somebody bring you know, her to the side. Like, what? But I just, I just, my friend literally just sent me that meme yesterday. And I was like, yeah. no. I was like, 30? No. 30? Oh my God. When, yeah. Look, when you turn 30, you think you figured it out. I know. No. No. Not of you have that same mentality like you get where you get because you believe you can get there mm. and i know that's something that he really like pushes so not to jump too much forward but when you start working with him did it more solidify that because that is like it seems like that's the mindset of tyler perry studios wow yeah i guess i guess, I guess you're right um for me, when I started working with him, first of all, you're excited you booked a regular girl, you're a series regular <laughs> on a national television show for BT or Tyler Perry show, all these things. So my mama was like, girl, you made it. I knew, I can say it, I knew. Tyler Perry saw you, right? <laughs> True story, I swear to you. Said my baby made it. <laughs> my baby, my made, baby it. made it. I made it, okay? Go so, ahead. and she would always say, I just really feel like you. And I'd be like, okay. So when I booked it, it was like, oh God, it was like the real prayer came true, right? Uh, but the the thing that really hit me with working with Tyler Perry and, and then being, I guess, introduced into the Tyler Perry way, because there's a Hollywood way and there's a Tyler Perry way, because he moves at a very different pace and in his own, and literally everything is completely different there. 
-hmm. So I came, everyone, you know, you come from the Hollywood way, you move at a much slower pace, you go there and it's like, okay, how am I supposed to do 100 pages today? How am I supposed to do 25 scenes in one day? Like, how, how is this supposed to happen? Yeah. What I then realized is I was able to stretch myself in ways that I never even thought to do. So now when when I tell myself, when I'm dreaming about something, I tell myself, like, you got to dream bigger. Sometimes you're feeling like you're at the peak of the bigness of that dream, but you're not. Mm -hmm. not, not even <laughs> like, close. I'm not even close, right? So then I not have to close. stretch my mind. Because in order to do what we do, to be successful, to watch the trajectory and the journey of Priscilla Owen, the character I play on Tyler Perry's The Oval, to see everything that I do on television and how it affects the world, I'm always like, wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. But I know it's also because of all of the work, everything that I put in every single day, because when I get to work, I only got one take. What you saw on television, ma'am, sir, I did that in one take, right? That's all we get. Mm -hmm. So when I go to work every day and I'm sitting next to not just another work for hire actor, director, producer, writer. No, I'm sitting next to the man who owned the building who got his name on the building. <laughs> like that right. hit different. <laughs> it hits different. Right? It hits different. It hits different. When you go drive up, it says Tyler Perry Studios and you go and sit next to Tyler Perry himself. And I'm like, wow. And it started in your mind. And he, yes, he always says, if I did this, if I did this, you can too. And I believe yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And I think that's my um my my office space is literally like down the street from the studio. Oh. So when I'm driving home, I drive past it. Mm. And it's it's always like that moment of this man built this <laughs> in this city from right. nothing. Right. Like literally from the mud, he built this. You better not quit. Mm. And and that's like that's it like that's the mindset you it. better not quit yeah like push harder like stretch further think bigger dream yeah. bigger like it's just it's always it's in the back of your mind there's a whole lot more that you can do mm -hmm. just believe you can do it and then go for it so it's agreed yeah that whole that whole situation you put that at, at the perfect place I was right like, I get to ride past this every day Absolutely. <laughs> Bet, yeah. <laughs> um, so, speaking of the old, then I'm gonna go back <clears throat> and get to like your your acting journey to this point. Sure. Um, speaking speaking of the oval, you work in which is insane to me, but it's it's Tyler Perry. You have a replica of the White House mm -hmm. in Atlanta that you walk into every day. Yeah. You guys started this series during the last presidency. And everyone was looking at it like, that's probably what's going on in that White House for real. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably yeah. what they're in their door for real. You got an insider somewhere <laughs> telling the right. truth. <laughs> so when you're when you're doing this and like you to get <clears throat> easy to picture yourself somewhere when you're just on a regular set. When you're in a structure that looks like that, was it was it easier to fall into character or did that make it harder to be in that space mm -mm. i can't say it was easier or, or harder if you will when we first started filming but well, the white house wasn't wasn't complete so the first okay. week a week and a half or so that we were there we were shooting everything outside of the white house and they were still building the white house so we would pass it and see it like why wow, is, is it gonna be ready i mean okay they say it's gonna, we gonna shoot yeah. in a couple weeks there you know and then literally it was like Brrr. The White House is like done. <laughs> and so I think because of, I, we got a chance to really see it go up while we were there filming the first time because it was it was stretched out. I think it was our first time working with him. And so it kind of, the way he was doing it, he was shooting half the week with sisters. The other half was the Oval. And it was giving us a little bit more time to get into his flow because we all, none of us had really done his his way. And I don't, I don't think any of us were really ready at the time to be like, day one, yeah. 25 feet, go. <laughs> you know, right. Um, that slows up your day. Day one, twenty five cents. Live, live, live. You know, <laughs> somebody give me my line. <laughs> I would be so in the he, corner crying. Right, like, people <laughs> were. People were like, I don't know how to do this. Um, <laughs> so to avoid that, I think he was like, let's just like warm them up, get them here, like make sure. But the, after that, we were we were running. But because I got a chance to see it go up. 
we were just so excited. Like, and everyone who didn't have a scene in the White House, we were like, girl, we're going to the White House today. <laughs> we were so excited to be there and to, and to see it and to know that, wow, this was like, I think it's like 96%. There's some type of in the 90s percentage exact replica of the White House. There's only like small little changes here and there. And I, I was just like, this is amazing. And it just made me, in those moments, like we're scenes where all of us are in the Oval Office or all of us are in the foyer except in the, you know, the first family in or all of us are in these different places. And I'm like, wow, this, this is major. Like, this is huge. And it just made me stretch my mind, made me, made me grow even more. So those moments make me grow. Those moment, moments make me be like, okay, I, I can be even better than what I thought I could be. Yeah. And so because we do so much content, when I do get auditions now, that's five, six pages, I can look at that and be like, okay, cool, cool, got it, got it, I can go it. I can pick it up a lot faster <laughs> because of it, because of the work and the skill set yeah. I now learn. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> so that's it? That's all you want me to do? Right. That's it. <laughs> six pages. Right. I'm like, oh, we're doing <laughs> one scene today? Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> like I'm right. done, so <laughs> I'm done. Right, yep. I'm like beyond yep. ready. But because we have one scene in three three pages, oh, I'll be beyond ready. I'll be I'll be like, oh, I got time. Okay, I'm gonna go over this. I'm gonna go over this. I, I mean, I'll be so right. ready. I'm so ready for everything. Because that's the other thing. I read something um, with Denzel Washington years ago, and he said, paraphrasing because I don't remember it verbatim, but he said, you know, choose wisely the roles that you want to do because film lasts forever. Yeah. And whatever it is you want to do, when you yeah. action, it's rolling. It lasts forever. Like that picture says a thousand words, if you will. So mm -hmm. I, want, I want to make sure that when I step on set and when that director says action, I'm doing my job. Like I'm hired to be here. I'm grateful to be here. I love doing what I do. People pay to either come see you on a play or, or pay to watch your channel or tune in every week on cable television to watch me every single week. So I don't mm -hmm. take that lightly. <clears throat> I take that yeah. very seriously. It's a responsibility. I don't want to show up and, and not know my lines. And then they're like, oh, you slowing down the whole day. And this, like, she don't know her lines. We can't do that. You got one like, job. <laughs> <laughs> know your lines. Know your lines. <laughs> That's it. Figure everything else out as you go, but know right. your lines. <laughs> know your lines. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like line, your line is like, <laughs> I got an attitude on set with me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I think what, what I enjoy about, about the Oval is it shows all the background of the life of being inside of a presidency. I don't think any of us ever thought about everyone that works in this house to make this house work. And I love that you guys show that and that there's so many intricate details that have to be done to make sure that like this thing that we see publicly is running smoothly. And then the drama that comes along with making sure this thing runs smoothly. I'm like, whose White House was this? And uh, you try to you try to figure it out. And it's like you start calling people up like that was by the bushes. And then right, it's like, right, right, right. Uh, that story right, was no, definitely that was, from, right, right. That's, that's <laughs> definitely from that one. But it's, I think it's, it's intriguing. Do you get, have you guys been approached or have you been approached by people that actually work in the White House and like, yeah, you did it. Like, that's it. I spoke to people prior to the show starting. Right. Okay. Um, and just to get an understanding of the flow and, you know, because even just in, in even reading the scripts, it was so much yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. Yes, sir. And no, sir. And I'm like, wow. So that's normal. OK. <clears throat> I mean, yes, you say it, but they overly say it sometimes. So I got a chance to read books and, and talk to different people who either used to work there or just got me on the phone with somebody at work there and had like short conversations to get a better understanding. But I have not. <laughs> had any conversations with anyone that worked there since the airing of our show. I think once okay. everyone saw it, it was like, oh, it's about it's the White House drama. And I'm like, yes, however, it 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 relies on the stories of the people who work there. And like you said, we're following them home to see what happens and what it does all while trying to run yeah. the White House. Yeah, yeah, so that's a little bit different. So I don't know that any of them would be like, yeah, that kind of happened. But because... <laughs> like, <laughs> You don't really hear from them, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's like I, signed, I signed this NDA and right, I was probably exactly. going to jail, but I, exactly. so I, I can't tell you. 
I can't tell you that what you actually showed that happened last year. I can't tell you that. <laughs> I can't tell you that. I can't tell you exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> it actually happened twice, but I can't tell you that happened. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> oh my god. Can you imagine? So, oh my goodness. Oh my god. I I I think that even after watching the show, it's that's a level of life that I want nothing to do with. Mm. Like I want I want <clears throat> nothing to do with the White House. There's right. like there's no thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely no thank you. Right. Um so your journey, how did how did acting start for you? You said you were modeling. Yeah, I started um modeling when I was much younger and the acting journey didn't really start until I graduated college. Cuz growing up where I was from, it was nothing at the time to really cultivate that skill set and I was on a track scholarship and a dance scholarship there was a theater program there but at that point I hadn't even done anything nor did I even think about it um that but that wasn't until I got into college <clears throat> excuse me and so when I graduated with my degree in broadcast journalism like mass com I was doing news and I was you know on, on camera and worked for NBC and Fox affiliates there locally in Louisiana and It was just something I was always like, "Hey, you should try this. You should try this." And mm -hmm. so, I moved to Houston. I remember staying with my sister for a little bit, and as I'm going to these acts, I found an acting class and workshops and stuff to go to. And I did, and at the end, they bring they have a big showcase, and they bring agents and managers and all this stuff, and I won three awards. And it was like a big, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And and the, the teacher was like, "No one's ever won three. I've maybe had a few people win two, and all my years of doing this, no one's ever won three. And I was like, "Wow, okay, what does that mean?" You know, and okay. and people were, you know, I got a lot of accolades, and people were just like, "Wow, wow, this is great." And I'm like, "Okay, wonderful." And but I'd always wanted to be in LA, not necessarily because I wanted to act. I wanted to be in LA because when I came to LA at seven years old, we came to Disneyland, and I was like, "This is the happiest place on earth." This is where I want to live. <laughs> But I love the weather. I love the palm trees. Like I loved all of that. And I was like, I just want to live in LA. Like I just knew I wanted to live here. And yeah. when I tried my hand at that and did well, I took another course. And my teacher was like, "You're ready. I really believe you should go to LA." And I was like, "Great," because I was going to go. And then I did. And then I took the journey and I drove from LA to LA, from Louisiana, all the way through Los Angeles. And the was journey that, began. Was that scary for you? No, it was super exciting. Multiple reasons. I say that because growing up in Louisiana, I always felt like I was made for a bigger city. Like I'm, I used to be like, I'm not supposed to be here. And even when I'd be in school or in college, people would be like, <clears throat> excuse me, people would be like, where are you from? Oh, I live around the corner. I'm, I'm from right here. <laughs> I live around the corner, you know. And I would get that all the time. Everyone thought I was from the East Coast. And I'm like, I don't know what East Coast energy I may be giving off at the time. But no, I'm from right here. So I was always ready to get out of Louisiana. One of the things I did know, that's the thing about the dichotomy of your mind. Like one part's like, I can't do this. The other part's like, you got to get out of this, right? Um, I always felt like I was made for something bigger, Yeah. And I knew I couldn't stay in the mindset of the people who didn't even want to leave the city. Like, I still know people who've never even left Lake Charles, and that's nothing wrong with that. But for me, what I wanted was to experience more that the world had to offer. Yeah. And if you don't want to experience that, cool, no problem. But for me, I was like, I want more of that experience. And so coming here was, now became my happy place. I was like, I love it here. But that's how yeah. the journey began. <clears throat> and... Being in LA, you put in years of work, like years of credits and like everything. And then your TV debut, how they're, how to explain, your TV debut is the Oval. Is that accurate? Well, TV debut dates back forever, but as a series regular, yes. Okay. Yeah. What was <clears throat> what was that moment when you again look back at your career and then you say series regular. And again, credits galore before series regular. What did that moment feel like for you? I know your mom was like my baby baby. <laughs> so, right, right, right. So so what was that what was that like for for you? 
I think it took for the show to come out for me to really for it to hit me. Yeah. And I and I don't know why. I think you know. I, I remember I remember being at TPS and you know we're working on this new show and no one's ever heard. No one oh, people's only heard about it. No one knows what it's about. And I remember being there with the guy who plays Sam, think Walter Fauntleroy. He and myself, and, and I, I think it was one other person in the room, and we were like, wow, I feel like we're on the, this is the big the calm before the storm. Like, it kind of felt like something big was happening, but everything mm-hmm. just moved so fast. Like, you booked it, you were there, you, all of a sudden, it was like, you got to learn lines. So you're you're in this space that you're thrust into, you got to learn, like, a book, you know, which I don't, I don't count my pages because on purpose because I don't want to miss like, into a space of, like, ah. 500 pages you know i don't know i just don't do it right. so, <laughs> my book is right. so thick right my, the book is like a you know it's a really big like a war and peace book of sides the lines you have to know <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so I, I think it went so fast from like you booked it yeah i'm excited i booked it now i gotta go to work i gotta learn what oh my god all these scripts okay great and you gotta learn everything and you get there and you're meeting people hey how you doing mm-hmm. I'm, i play this you play that we don't know each other right and then we just go to work so I think it wasn't until for me that the, you see the intro. Ah, that's it. When the intro came on, because that's the one thing I ne- didn't know what was going to happen, any, know anything about. Because I filmed everything else. Let's just see what you know what I did, right? Yeah. But when the intro for the television show came on, and we had a big screening for it, it was me and a few other cast members got together. We had a big screening in downtown LA. Invited everyone. You know, this is pre-COVID, and we had about 150 people in the place. Like we took over the whole restaurant. And um, when it came on and we all started cheering, it was like, wow, that's it. That was the feeling. That was the yeah. moment for me that was like, I made it. I feel like there's levels to making it. Like there's, okay, your first level, your second level. That was another leveling up for me that was like, that's it. Because I've been praying for or saying, I'm going to be a series regular, series regular. But now it was the moment that I felt it. And I hate to do this to you. Most people, when you when you when you get to that point, mm-hmm. there's a moment that you cry because it's almost unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> but it's I'm proud and I'm excited, but I can't believe it. And it's just like it's overwhelming, and you cry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When did that happen? <sighs> I think sure. That's good. That's good. Uh, I think two times. The first time. It wasn't the overwhelming, it was the, it was the wow. It was when we all were flown back to Los Angeles after Tyler Perry walks in the room. And we had a big day of chemistry reads. That's where I met Walter, the guy who played Sam and all these things. And then when everything's over, we all are in a big room. And he goes, he comes in, he goes, welcome to the Oval. And everybody was like, ah! And so everyone's super <laughs> excited. And we're all like, oh my God, oh my God. But it wasn't until we're all flying home that I think that was the moment of like, yo, like, yo, you did it. Like, that was the moment that it hit me and I got emotional and I started crying. That moment. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> all things, all things, you know, <clears throat> over, over-related. And now you start moving on to new projects. Mm-hmm. I have Lola 2, which is the second installment of Lola. That's going to be coming out now in the summer. It's a boxing film and it's based on a female... Well, she's now a female, she's becoming a female boxer. So it's like a coming of age story of a woman trying to find her voice, trying to find who she is. Um, she gets assaulted and that leads her to self-defense courses, which then leads her into boxing. And that's when she falls in love with the sport and finds her purpose. So that's Lola. So I had to learn how to box. I did not know a thing about boxing. But when you watch that movie, huh. <laughs> so, so, so don't get it twisted. You can't don't get beat get up. Twisted. Right, right. <laughs> The second one, we had the Olympic winner, you know, amazing Carissa Shields in it. And she was mm-hmm. my opponent in that one. And I remember being in the ring with her the first time being like, so um, I know your job is to be a boxer and beat people up, but my job is to pretend. So let's make sure. We're <laughs> <laughs> professional. I'm a professional. Okay. Let's make sure we stay on the same let's page. Let's make we're sure pretending. we're good. We're pretending Don't hit. Right now. Don't okay, hit me for real. God. Hallelujah. All right. God. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, let's make sure. She was a sweetheart. I loved working with her. She was amazing. Um, but I definitely had a moment of like, okay, I don't know what she's going to be like. 
Mentor, I need my eyes. And I remember, I remember talking to Tom Perry about it. He was like, please don't mess up your face because you got to come through the oval right after that. Please don't do that. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. I want, I'll make sure. I'm going to tell him you said. I'm going to tell him you said. <laughs> Tyler, Tyler said. Don't mess up my face. I'll be messing with my face. I feel next week. Exactly. Literally, I left one and went to the other. So I was like, whew, they got my face. Great job. He was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Look, because if so, yeah, he came back it. with a bruise, he would have he would have wrote it into the script. Oh, totally. Tell me what happened. Totally. Oh, totally. It would have been He's in like, there somewhere. We're gonna use it. We're gonna use <laughs> no. it. Oh god. <laughs> like so you were fighting the first lady? Wow. <laughs> Everybody's like, finally, we've been wanting to see that forever. <laughs> so. <laughs> but yeah, Lola 2 is what's coming out. And then from there I moved into um wanting to give back and wanting to help as many people as I, as I could kind of navigate this business because it all started because people kept asking me over and over and over again how to navigate the business. And that's where the Working Actors Academy was built. It's a self-paced course. You can just go online. There's seven modules. You can go at your leisure and take everything. And when you finish the course, you will be a much better, well-rounded actor in the business. But the thing about mm -hmm. acting is you can be a career student your whole life. But if you don't know what it takes to book the job, you will never be a working actor. I know plenty yeah. of career students. That's what you want to do, no problem. But I've taken everything that I've learned thus far and continue to learn and put it into the Working Actors Academy to help you become successful. So yeah. that's the next thing. And then from there, I went into hair care. So, which, um, I know. <laughs> which I was going to get into that because like, it's flowing when you, when you, when you do this. It's, it's, yeah, it's there. So, so like... <laughs> how, how, how that happen? Yeah, so interesting enough, just being in this business and, you know, they put a, a lot of heat and stuff that can be done to your hair over time because your hair has to look great every day. So it's like, oh, let me get it. Let me get it straight. Let me curl it again. Let me whatever. And my hair mm -hmm. was getting really thin. My hair was breaking off and my edges had left me completely. And I was like, I'm way too young not to have edges. Like, that is not okay. <laughs> So, two conversation I have with myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from there, I was like, okay, I have to figure this out. And I just started looking up and doing a lot of research on natural things that could help grow your hair. I did extensive research on that. Um, found some, found a bunch of different ingredients. And I was like, okay, let me see what this will do. And it completely worked. I gave it to everybody I knew. I sent it to people. People were like, can you give it to my friend? And my friend, yes, yes, yes. Then I went into like herbal classes to find out more about the herbs. And now I'm like, oh, I want to learn as much as I can about this, right? Mm -hmm. All the different properties and how to use it and what you can do and all this stuff. And I did and helped so many people that suffered with male pattern baldness, alopecia, to just thinning hair, to dandruff, to dry, frizzy hair, all these different hair elements, ailments that yeah. people were having. It was like my product was helping. And that's where Taj Hair Growth Stimulant was born. And now it is, uh, we, we launched it right before Thanksgiving. It's doing very well. We have an oil and we have a tonic. The oil obviously is the oil based. The tonic is a water based. If you don't want that, you know, heavier oil in your hair, um, it works on all hair types from 1A to 4C. So that's really fine all the way to 4C hair, whatever, everything in between. And it's worked for men, women, and kids. So I have so many yeah. people that hit me up and they're just like, oh my God. Like when I get their testimonials or they're crying or they write something or they send me a video. And, and sometimes people don't want you to see their face, but they'll just do it so you can see. And I'm like, just write something so the world can see what you've right. done and the journey you've been on and how the success you've had. And that is the most rewarding thing for me. So in my company, yeah. my company is called The Dream Is Real. That's the parent company for the Taj, for the TWAA and all of that. So back again back to speaking life over your life but i wanted to make sure that my company was in of service so both of my my service both of my products and everything that i do helps people so i love yeah. it i love Thank it what, what is at <clears throat> this point mm -hmm. um what's what's your proudest moment mm, being able to take care of my parents that was always the biggest goal in life <laughs> that i wanted to be in a position to where my parents would want for anything and I'm there yeah. and that was the biggest proudest moment is that I wanted them to be able to experience to things yeah yeah because I want them to experience things and travel the world and do the things that I'm now able to do you know and I'm like I, I know as a parent you sacrifice things that I may have seen as a kid or things that I have no idea about right yeah. my mom can tell me stories now and I know we grew up in a nice middle class family but there are moments that we ate 
she would make this hot dogs and write with rice and butter. But that was like my favorite meal as a kid. I didn't know that I had to yeah. eat it, right? But it's all in the presentation yeah. for children. So, and I'm like, oh, wow, there was a moment we did eat that a little bit, you know, but that was a sacrifice that had to be made. And, and so I'm always like, I want, I don't want to just tell you about this experience and this amazing trip I went on. I want you to have that same experience. So yeah. that's like the, the driving force for me. That's why, you know, in my companies, I want to make sure not only that they're successful for other people, but also for my parents, because I want them to live their, their latter part of their life in a much easier way than what they did before. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think that's I think that's the goal yeah. that most of us should have mm-hmm. is making sure that, you know, because a lot of our parents sacrifice for us. Totally. So making sure they not necessarily repaying it back because you can never repay back those sacrifices, right. but being able to show the appreciation for it and say that you can relax now. I got it. Okay. Like that's that is the goal. So that is the goal. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you.